to the man known as the chameleon who helped shape the future of modern music and who didn't enjoy Disney's Fantasia very much, we say happy birthday, Igor Stravinsky! Hi all, it's Mike. Today is the 17th of June, which means it's my mother-in-law's birthday. Happy birthday, Lugene, love ya. But it's also Igor Stravinsky's birthday. And that means I gotta wear this wicked awesome hat. It's got candles on it. Was it worth the three pounds I paid for it? Yeah. Igor Fyodorovich Stravinsky was born in 1882 near St. Petersburg, Russia, where he would grow up. His family's financial situation was quite stable, at least partly due to the fact that they were descendants of a Polish noble family. His exposure to music began pretty much at birth because his father, Fyodor, was a prominent bass opera singer. He even debuted a few roles in some Tchaikovsky and Rimsky-Korsakov operas. Igor's own musical life begins really as most children's do, with him beginning piano lessons at a very young age. A major difference, though, between him and other little boys is that he actually loved practicing the piano. At least enough to be able to perform Mendelssohn's first piano concerto by the time he was 15. It's not an easy piece. pretty alright. While he was studying the piano, he was also dabbling in composition. While still very young, he did a condensed piano version of one of Alexander Glazunov's string quartets, which Alex wasn't super impressed with. He's reported to have expressed the opinion that Stravinsky really wouldn't go anywhere in music, that he lacked the necessary skills. Stupid Alex. As far as formal training in music, at least in academia, Igor really didn't have a whole lot of it. When he went to the University of St. Petersburg in 1901, he actually went to study law. Well, he signed up to study law. The records show that he actually skipped most of his classes. But he did graduate. Uh, sort of. Bloody Sunday, the day when the Tsar's Imperial Guard opened fire on unarmed protesters outside Winter Palace, shut down the university for two months and prevented him from taking his final exams. So he was awarded a half-course diploma. Maybe it was a good thing that he couldn't take his exams, because I mean, if he didn't go to class, he probably wouldn't have done that well. The year of his graduation, Igor married Yekaterina Nesenko, whom he had known since childhood. Probably because they were first cousins. Now, funny as it may sound, that wasn't very uncommon back in those days. Several other composers, Rachmaninoff, Grieg, Mio, all married their first cousins, as did many other prominent heads of state, writers, and scientists. It, it, different times, you know. Later, he would actually get involved in an affair with Russian-American dancer Vera Deboset, and the two would get married in 1939 after his first wife died of tuberculosis. Igor and Vera are now buried in Venice. During his studies at the USP, go to headed bird, he grew more and more interested in composition and eventually worked up the initiative to take some of his music to Nikolai Rimsky-Korsakov, who, unlike Alex Glazunov, really saw the potential in the boy and took him on as a student. This is where Stravinsky's talent was honed and refined and what would begin his very long and very successful career. Let that be a lesson to all of you aspiring musicians out there, whether your performance, whether your composition, doesn't matter. Whom you study with is so much more important than where you study. Igor and Nikolai worked together for three years, focusing mainly on orchestration, which is something that both of them are considered to be masters of. Stravinsky found his first big break in 1910, thanks to the laziness of this guy here. Anatoly Liadov. The story goes that famed impresario and producer Sergei Diaghilev, who could rock a top hat like nobody's business, commissioned Liadov to write a ballet for his ballet ruse. The thing is that Liadov was a champion procrastinator. After several months, when the projected deadline was coming up, Diaghilev contacted Liadov to see how things were going. And his response? Well, yesterday, I bought the paper. He got fired. However, Diaghilev had recently heard two orchestral pieces by a new up-and-coming composer from St. Petersburg, the Scherzo Fantastique and Fireworks. So he decided to pass on the commission to Igor Stravinsky. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the Firebird was born. His next big ballet, Petrushka, was also a big success. But the piece that really launched his career and cemented him in the Composer Hall of Fame was his next commission, Rite of Spring. If your music is so innovative as to start a riot at the premiere, you're gonna get a lot of publicity. Stravinsky is sometimes nicknamed the Chameleon, as he was able to write in a lot of different styles, some of them widely varying. But he didn't just write in a lot of different styles. He wrote them very, very well. I mean, when you listen to his student works, like Pulsinea, it's, it's almost as if you've been transported back in time to the Baroque era. 
His early professional works, like the Firebird, have hints of high romanticism. I mean, he proficiently used bitonality and serialism, and he was on the forefront of neoclassicism. I was first introduced to his music when I was a child watching Disney's Fantasia. The Fantastic Philadelphia Orchestra, conducted by Leopold Stokowski, performed his Rite of Spring to the animation of a coldly accurate reproduction of what science thinks went on during the first few billion years of this planet's existence. You know, it's the dinosaur one. That T-Rex part always frightened me as a child. Stravinsky was actually the only living composer to hear his work portrayed in that film when it came out. And he didn't like it very much. Sorry, Leo, you just... you just didn't do a good job. Stravinsky, of course, was a prolific composer. His complete list of works contain eight operas or theater pieces, including The Rake's Progress and A Soldier's Tale, 12 ballets, 24 orchestral pieces, including three symphonies, Symphony in C, Symphony in Three Movements, and Symphony of Psalms, four concertos, or concerti, whatever, 14 works for chorus, 21 pieces for solo voice, 25 chamber pieces, including another symphony for a wind ensemble, 21 piano pieces, and a whole lot of arrangements of other pieces, including one of the Star Spangled Banner. Many have referred to him as one of, if not the single most important composer of the 20th century. And so again we say, happy birthday, Igor Stravinsky! Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you also for liking, subscribing, and sharing this video. Don't forget about the playlist down in the description. We've provided a sample of Stravinsky's best works, as well as a lot of the works that aren't as well known. What are your favorite pieces or factoids about Stravinsky? What do you think of his impact on modern music? Leave a comment down below, and happy listening!